Well, welcome to this uh, Bonsell video. I'm delighted to have uh, Peter Walker with me today. Uh, Peter, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I'm a clinical psychologist and from about, uh, I think, 2005, so for the last, uh, what's that, um, seven or eight years, I've been doing um, uh, reports for the court. So you've written several reports? Uh, yes. And we're talking about grammar. Yes. Now, um, is that a particular interest for you? I think it, I think it is because um, uh, I've had to learn um, the hard way through writing expert reports um, to get my grammar and punctuation up so, to speed. So do you think that uh, experts really write reports that are understandable? I, from my experience, I've written a lot, I've seen a lot, and I've reviewed a lot as well. Um, and I think that there is a variety of skill in this area. But surely um, they've had a lot of training in this, so don't they get it right? I think it's an assumption that people, if you've got to a certain level of uh, professional ac academic experience, are really proficient at writing um, reports. And I think the other thing about expert witness work is I would say the report writing is at the very high end of conveying in writing very complex and formal uh, material and opinion. Um, so, for example, with psychologists in clinical practice, a lot of the standard uh, letter writing, uh, formal writing, is uh, two to three page letters to GPs. Um, and when you're having to go on to a kind of 20 to 30 to 40 page expert um, report, um, you know, there's much more room for having to convey complex events, complex uh, relationships, sets of circumstances. And that's when you can uh, stumble into grammatical errors. Yeah, but, but why is grammar important? You know, we have a world of texts and uh, emails now. Why is grammar important for experts' reports? I think, I think you're right. We do live now in uh, a world with a lot of uh, quick communications and uh, new ways of symbolising meaning. Um, in sort of uh, informal and formal settings. But I think with um, expert witness work, it requires a greater deal of formality for a start. Um, and secondly, as I say, the material that you're conveying is complex. And if you don't get the grammar and the punctuation right, it can lead to ambiguity. So you're focusing on the reader of the report, presumably. Yes. So, presumably the writer of the report understands what they're trying to say. It's what's communicated to the reader. Yes, yes and no, but it is also, in my experience, um, a very important um, thing to get right for yourself when you're writing a report. Because actually what we're talking about is the organisation of relevant, ordered material. Um, that's necessary in, in formulating your opinion. So you, if you're muddled with that, then it's likely that you're going to be somewhat vague, confused um, about your actual opinion, what you really think is going on. So grammar is important for clarity of thought and clarity of communication. Yes. Well, can you give us some tips to help us here? Okay. I think one of the important tips is um, be, be clear about who you're writing this for. Um, sometimes in, for example, in my field, clinical psychology, clinical psychologists talk to each other a lot about everyday issues that they come across and forget that actually this might be foreign language for non-psychologists. Um, Something that I come across quite a lot is the um, is the concept of working memory. Um, psychologists know what working memory is. It is a confusing term because actually working memory is much more related to attention and concentration abilities than to, 
than to memory. But I review a number of reports and often that is not, the term is not clarified, leading the reader to think that this person has either strengths or weaknesses in memory, when actually this is more of a concentration, concentration issue. issue. So it's, uh, I mean, we've seen this at Bond Cell, and often experts write the report in the language for another expert. Yes. <laughs> Whereas, of course, the reader is often a judge, or it could be a jury, yes. or it could be an arbitrator, uh, who may not understand the technical yes. issues. Well, let's look at some of the sort of practical points here. Punctuation. Punctuation. It's very important to know your punctuation, to feel confident with your punctuation. Um, a classic example is uh, the rules around apostrophes. Um, and I think that sometimes with punctuation, um, when people aren't clear about it, they also feel um, somewhat embarrassed about it. They can't really admit to it because they should know it or, or they feel right. it, it's basic. So people often kind of, uh, sort of work through it and try and muddle through it and, and don't quite get it right. Um, the apostrophe rule, of course, around uh, possession is that, um, generally speaking, if you're talking about uh, something belonging to more than one thing, uh, the apostrophe should go after the S. If you're talking about a singular thing, the apostrophe should go before the S. Um, and also, presumably, commas, splitting up a sentence. Commas, making, you know, giving the um, the text a rhythm, because actually that's important as well. If you're reading through something, I often find myself reading through um, text and finding almost, I'm, I'm waiting for the breath. I'm waiting to mm. be able to take mm. a breath because it's just going on and, and, and on. And it isn't broken up with commas which is where the um, pauses um, well, naturally fall. Yes. Well, I presume that leads on to length of sentences. Yes. Do you have any comments about that? What's the right thing to do with sentences? I think um, it's, a, it's a really common problem that um, you'll write a sentence and you're just trying to cram too much into it. You start it off and then you don't quite know how to finish it. Um, and actually, again, you, if you read through it, you might get that um, discomfort in reading it. That's you know, waiting for that kind of natural break. Mm, mm, if there's a strain it places on people's attention. So shorter sentences rather than long. Yes. yes. And that's easier to read, less ambiguous. Yes. Um, quotations, often experts have to quote either a source material or what somebody said. Any comment on that? I think that there's an art to doing that um, and um, sometimes you can start a quote off literally by saying Mr Smith said so, such and such. then start the quote. Often though you're trying to integrate it into the meaning of the sentence. And often we put quotes in because the quote itself, if we try and formally state what that person said, it kind of loses me meaning of the original thing that was said. So sometimes, um, I guess it's, you know, from the horse's mouth uh, sort of uh, sense with that. Um, but um, uh, the way that that gets integrated into the sentence is important. It should, it should be able to flow. Um, a common issue is about um, quotes where the uh, person you've interviewed is, is saying something about themselves, so the word me is put in there. And it doesn't read well if you're referring to them in the third person and then put in a quote with me, me in it. it. Yes. In those cases, what I do is I take the me out and I put in parentheses him to show that actually he didn't say Oh, I he didn't refer to himself yes. in the third person, but um, it helps to the, the sentence to flow. I think there's a tendency these days to want shorter reports. People pay less for reports these days. Yes. So, any comment on detail versus pressy? Yes. Well, I think that 
one of the errors that people can make is that they do their interview. It's been a thorough interview. It's covered all areas as it should do. Mm. And then what they do is they try to reproduce or rephrase what they've asked, what their notes say, into their reports. So it's a very blow by blow. Mr. Smith said this, and then he said that, and then he reported this, and then he reported that. And actually a lot of the detail in there is um, superfluous. It's not actually necessary for the opinion. Um, one big tip that I would say is to try and do it from memory. Right. That's not to disregard your notes and never look at them again, because you might miss out details, but actually by abandoning that and thinking about the core elements of what the person told you, you will get most of what you need to, what you need to get across. down in there. And then you read back through your notes and see what, what bits have you missed out, what details need to go, go into that. And I think that's a really, really helpful way of being able to communicate um, the interview material. So you check back that's consistent with the notes or the source yes. material. Talking about consistency, the consistency between a heading and the actual sentence. Any comments on that? Um, in 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 what way? Well, if if you've got, uh, is the sentence consistent with the opening clause? Yes, yes. Um, that's a really important um, issue, and I think it's it's a mistake that I make. When Can I you give us an example of that? Well, it might be an example of starting a sentence off um, in a way such as according to Mr. Smith's account. When he was a child, um, he uh, used to play football. Now, that would be the correct way of putting it. But sometimes people put, in, put, put something in like that. They might be used to saying something like Mr. Smith reported that. And so you have something like, and according to Mr. Smith, um, he used to play football as a child, and that he went to St. James's Primary School. So you've got an unnecessary oh, that in there because you've forgotten what how you introduce the sentence. So it's always, and I think when you long sentences, they have the danger of the more clauses you put in, you start to detach it from the opening calls. So it's about checking back, rereading the material, making sure it's consistent, making sure you haven't gone astray really. Yes. Now often reports are quite long, turgid, I hate to say it, that's boring. Any comments on making them interesting? Uh, I think it comes back to um, uh, pulling out the themes um, and not, not um, over including all the material that you, you put in there. So sometimes pulling out themes and thinking, okay, one or two examples of this theme might be helpful to put in here so that I'm evidencing this theme. So I might be um, giving uh, an impression of, you know, that there, that there was this theme that seemed to be coming out of this person's account. But I shall help the reader by saying, for example, at this point in the interview, he said this, and at this, this point, another point in the interview, he said that. So you're not, there might be 10 examples like that, but you don't want to put all of the 10 examples in. So it's helping to highlight for the reader kind of what the themes were that were coming out of, of, of this person's assessment. So how it might affect the reader, or what the effect might be. Mm. What's the difference between effect and effect? Because that's a common error, isn't it? Yes, it is, and I think it's um, particularly in my field because um, you have affect and effect. Now, you have a noun, you have nouns that are spelt in both ways, and you have verbs that are spelt in both ways. So it can be confusing. Generally speaking, with the nouns, affect refers to emotion or feeling. So in psychological reports, we sometimes we need to know about affect mm. uh, and that it's spelled that way. But with the noun effect, we say effect, it's the effect that something has had on something, the impact. Right. Um, when you're looking at the verbs, 
affect is when something makes an effect. This is where it gets confusing. So it affected me very much. Spelled with the A. Effect is much more specific as a verb, and it's about affecting a change or somehow right. bringing about a change. Still important, in particularly in psychological reports, because we're often talking about change and making psychological change. Um, so that's a very important. So if you come across either of those words, just double check to use them correctly. Double check, yes. Yeah. Now another thing that's the bane of judges' lives is acronyms, when people use shorthand terms. And any thoughts on that? Um, well, I would say that, uh, you know, going back to my on so, so long days of uh, training, that um, a glossary is useful, or at least the first time that you use an acronym, either expand what what that means and then put the acronym in brackets right um or use a glossary or both to explain um, but you know it, it's it's a really easy trap to fall into because if you're in your expert area you will be talking all the time about things like ptsd which is post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. or adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder but people outside of that area of expertise aren't necessarily they're going to know not it. familiar. No. They might do, but um, they might not. Now, of course, a report is often the basis of where the cross-examination will come. Mm -hmm. And so phrases like seems to, I mean, there's various words that a council will look at and think, ah, oh, there's a bit of vagueness there. Any comments on terms like that? I, I would, my advice on that would be Think what you're trying to say. Are you saying, you know, sometimes it's the case that we, it is, you know, it, it lies in the balance. It's, you know, we can't say whether it's going to be this or whether it's going to be that. So it, it's kind of an even probability. We need to kind of say that and expand mm. that's exactly what we mean. Um, terms like may, and this is, this is a really difficult one for psychologists, for example, because actually when we're undergraduates, one of the first things we're taught is there are all of these possibilities, so don't talk with certainty. You need to be putting may, this may be the case, or this may not right. be the case. In court, what they're looking for is opinion, and if you can say that in your opinion you think something is more likely than not to be the case, you need to say that. So getting away from protecting yourself through being vague, you, you need to sort of actually say what, sure. what, what you think is... Because it can open up to quite difficult cross-examination. Yes. I think the final point which uh, all experts should consider is checking before they <laughs> sign it off. Any thoughts, final thoughts on proofreading? Well, I'd say it's a, definitely a must. Um, I have read, I have read my own reports that have been reviewed um, in court and noticed the odd typographical error in right. there. Um, so it's not just maybe about reviewing it; it's about carefully reviewing it. Sure. And then, not speed reading. No, one la and one last um, proofread because. Um, you know, we rely a lot on technology and spell checking and stuff like that. But, you know, I've seen mistakes where the word my has, I, I've typed it as may. Right. That's, that's a word and it's not going to come up in a spell, in check. a spell checker. Yeah. And it's been missed during review, but it's sort of embarrassing because you look at that and you think, well, if I were a barrister, I'd be, I'd be possibly making the point of, you know, ha have you been rigorous enough of here? Course. Have you looked through this properly? The other, um, the other really uh, big one is just checking that you haven't put a not, N-O-T, into your sentence or omitted one to give it totally the opposite, the opposite meaning, meaning of what you mean. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one to be um, to be looking out for. So I, I have also read, um, you know, people who reviewed my reports. I've read their reports sometimes, and seen that I don't think you've proofread this because it is full of typographical errors. And so it, actually, it does 
people a big disservice because goes against your credibility yeah. and so basically don't sign the report until you are absolutely satisfied it's right yeah and that is a difficult one sometimes because I, in my experience in a lot of other uh, psychologists and I expect lots of other experts experience the reality of it is that you are writing up to a deadline and sure. it, it, there's a s amount, a fair degree of stress involved in kind of getting that ready. But one final proofread. Then sign. Then sign off and then send it off. Well, Peter, thank you very much indeed. It's been really helpful. And thank you very much for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.